welcome everyone on this, well, either Friday evening or Friday afternoon or Friday morning, depending where, or night if there's someone from Australia. Um, welcome to the first session of the Low Country Seminar. Uh, we're very, very glad to have you here um, and that we can still do this across the entire planet in via Zoom. That's one of the benefits of this whole uh, pandemic. Um, and we're very, very excited to welcome Maria Elena Kars as the first speaker. Um, she is, well, I'm assuming looking at the, the list of attendees, you know who she is, but still I'll introduce. Um, she's a historian of slavery and the early modern Atlantic and a professor in history at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And she's one of the editors of a three volume, The Cambridge History of the American Revolution, which is forthcoming, which we can all look forward to. And her mo most recent monograph is Blood on the River, a Chronicle of Mutiny and Freedom on the Wild Coast, uh, which has been getting rave reviews and has been shortlisted for the 2021 Condell Prize in History and is a finalist for the Frederick Douglass Prize, which is all fantastic. And it's also been translated into Dutch recently, um, entitled Bloed in the Rivier, het onbekende verhaal van de massale slavenopstand in een Nederlandse kolonie. So if you've got any Dutch speaking people in the vicinity you want to send this to, um, definitely do that. Um, I'll with great pleasure pass on to you, as you may have noticed already before I forget, um, the record button has been hit. So if you are not happy to be seen on screens, um, you're warned now, basically. But over to Maria Elena. Thanks for doing this. Hello. <laughs> Welcome everybody. Uh, thanks to Lisbeth and all the other members of the Low Countries History Seminar. It's a delight to be in London, even if it's virtually, uh, and to talk about my book Blood uh, on the River, which got published last year. Um, I'm really excited to talk with a group of people who, um, who focus on the Low Countries, although it fills me with a bit of trepidation because I'm definitely not an historian of the Low Countries, I'm an historian uh, of the Atlantic world, so I feel like a bit of an interloper. I'm going to try and share my screen with you to show a few slides. Uh, I think, God knows why it's in PowerPoint, but uh, maybe it will work. And I have to say play from start. Are you all seeing the first screen with the cover of the book? Yeah, okay, great. And you can still hear me too? Excellent, good, and we're in business. Whew. Always a relief. Um, so um, Blood on the River tells the story of a little known, but well, outside of Guyana, little known, but long lasting and nearly successful slave rebellion that almost changed the history of the Americas. The insurgents took over the entire colony uh, and kept the Dutch at bay for more than a year. It took place in 1763 and 1764 in a Dutch colony called Berbice, later British Guiana, and now the Republic of Guiana, uh, on the Caribbean coast of South America, wedged between Suriname and Venezuela and bordered on the south by Brazil. Blood on the River talks about the various people involved in that conflict, obviously African and African descended people, both were all uh, both combatants and bystanders, but also detractors, European colonizers and uh, European soldiers from the Dutch Republic, as well as from Dutch colonies in, in Suriname and St. Eustatius. And it talks about Amerindian allies of the Dutch. And the book really describes a topsy-turvy world. Former slaves are in charge for, as I said, uh, more than a year. The supposedly mighty colonists are stuck uh, on a plantation near the coast for more than a year. Uh, the insurgent governor uh, and the Dutch governor both battle uh, internal dissension in their ranks uh, and crippling uh, shortages. Um, European soldiers are very unhappy with their working conditions in the colony and in fact a regiment that is stationed on the border between Suriname and Berbice mutinies uh, 
And some 45 of those soldiers go and join the rebels, the very people they had come to fight. Um, Amerindians play a crucial role in the suppression of this rebellion, as do a number of African and African descended people, in particular several important rebel leaders who towards the end of the rebellion uh, switch sides, uh, help the Dutch, and according to the Dutch military commander, without their help it would have taken the Dutch another year to suppress this rebellion. And so I, I'm going to do three things today. I want to tell you a little bit about how I came to write this book and the sources that I used to write it. I'm going to briefly tell you about the Berbice Rebellion and the colony of Berbice itself. And then I want to draw out some of the internal dynamics of the rebellion, which I think to me are the most important parts of the book. So let me see whether I can advance the slide. Um, I came to the topic, I have to admit, um, uh, by happenstance, and this is probably a place many of you will uh, recognize, but several years ago, I spent some time in the National Archives in The Hague. I had just finished a book uh, called uh, Breaking Loose Together about a farmer's rebellion in North Carolina on the eve of the American Revolution. Uh, so again, a rebellion in the 1760s, and I was eager to branch out from the British Atlantic and from early America into the Atlantic world. And I frankly also thought that it would be fun to spend my summers doing research in the Netherlands, where, as you can probably surmise from my accent, I, I grew up. And so at the National Archives, I came across about 100 feet of documents about a place uh, that was uh, that I wasn't really familiar with called Berbis. And I was quite surprised to see that the collection contained the records of a huge slave uprising, uh, which was massive and long lasting, but had been but little studied. Uh, and the records were extraordinary. There was the daily journal of the Dutch governor um, transcribed, I think it's 450 single spaced pages uh, in Microsoft Word. Um, there were, uh, was correspondence between the Dutch colonial uh, authorities at home and the colonial folks in Berbis. There were reports by military leaders and soldiers who went on expeditions against the rebels uh, and on and on and on. Sort of the usual stuff you would expect in a colonial archive. Um, more tantalizing were 500 pages of examinations, as the Dutch called them, um, in which they, these were judicial, judicial investigations of people once they were re-enslaved at the end of the rebellion and who were being examined by the Dutch as the rebellion was being suppressed. And this is what they looked like, almost 900 people, which is almost half of the surviving adults, were questioned as suspects and as witnesses uh, in the, during the end and the aftermath of the rebellion. Of course, those records suffer from all the usual problems associated with uh, testimony produced under duress in response to very specific and often leading questions. People gave careful and strategic answers. Uh, their answers were mediated by the European clerk who translated uh, Creole Dutch into standard Dutch, uh, often summarized answers, uh, said things like, he said a lot more, but I'm not writing it down because it's not relevant. Uh, and also rendered uh, the great majority of the testimony in the third person rather than the first person. Many of the testimonies are short and others go on for pages and pages. Uh, about a third of those questioned are women. And these records are really rare in the 18th century. Uh, the judicial investigations of uh, the 1760 revolt, revolt in Jamaica, for instance, Becky's revolt, are all missing. And in another major rebellion in the 18th century, uh, Saint-Domingue, of course, for obvious reasons, there are no judicial investigations because the rebels won. Uh, 
unlike me, the Dutch did not care much for the internal politics of the rebellion. They focused their questions on what they cared about, which were principally who had been a leader in the rebellion, who had destroyed Dutch property, mainly through arson, by, by burning down plantation houses and so on. And the third thing, uh, which is what they called Christian murder. And with their lives on the line, of course, enslaved people had every reason to omit and to distort and to lie in their answers. And it's hard to know how to read testimony when you're robbed of the uh, emotional cues that are expressed in effect or silences or hesitations. And, but yet, despite such important caveats, I think that this is testimony that provides a firsthand view of the politics and the lived realities of people in rebellion in, in granular, intimate detail. The records tell not only about rebel leaders, uh, but, and this is more unusual, I think, uh, about the experiences of, of uh, regular everyday uh, folks, uh, how the rebellion was experienced by ordinary Africans and African descended people. The records chronicle how people fought and evaded the Europeans uh, and their allies, uh, how they dealt with the traumas of war as they struggled to survive, even more intriguingly, the records um, expose deep disagreements about what freedom and autonomy meant to a people with both relatively slim chances of success and more importantly, slim chances of survival. And, and I was particularly interested in that aspect of the rebellion, these differences of opinion, because I had just finished a book about the American Revolution which was a complex rebellion in which people fought uh, in, the, in the words of Carl Becker, the historian Carl Becker, not only over home rule, but over who should rule at home. Um, and so this, the American Revolution was like the rebellion in Berbice, uh, a, a struggle where people disagreed over the meaning of autonomy and independence and freedom. In addition to the 900 uh, court records, I found, and, and this was really an equally extraordinary um, cache, I think, a, a trove of letters that were written uh, or exchanged between the rebel governor Kofi and the Dutch governor Van Hogenheim um, as part of the rebels' attempt at diplomacy that took place in the summer of 1763. And these letters again are pretty special. We have uh, not a ton of letters from slave rebels. We have some. We do have quite a few letters from Maroon leaders, uh, Maroons being enslaved people who ran away to the hinterlands and set up their own individual or own independent communities, villages, and so on. So we have letters from them in Suriname, in Jamaica, in Colombia, in Mexico, other places in South Carolina dating back to, oh, the early 16th century, I believe. But um, the letters that Kofi wrote are particularly bold and uh, his proposals are quite revolutionary as we will see. And so they provide interesting insight both uh, into Kofi's thinking and into the intellectual history of, of the Black Atlantic. So let me quickly sketch for you then the, uh, the, 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 a bit, bit of a portrait both of Berbice and of the rebellion itself. A uh, couple of maps here, you see here, I don't know whether you can see my cursor, but the Berbice River, I'm sure you all know where it is, but just in case. Um, a different view is uh, French Guiana, Suriname, what was later British Guiana and you, now Guiana and then Venezuela with Brazil in the, in the south. So this is where it's located. Berbice got its uh, start in the 1620s when it was uh, begun as a private patroonship uh, and it grew slowly uh, in the early 18th century. It was taken over by a joint stock company located in Amsterdam. 
the Societeit van der Bies, uh, generally called the company. And uh, the company ran the colony under the auspices of the uh, States General, the Staten General, the Dutch government, for the rest of the 18th century. The colony was small and certainly compared to neighboring Suriname, um, underdeveloped. Uh, there were, uh, on the eve of the rebellion, some 350 Europeans, of whom probably less than half were actually Dutch. Some 350 Europeans forced some 4,500 to 4,000, 5,000 enslaved Africans and African descended people to grow mostly coffee, cotton and cacao. Uh, and only about a third of them actually grew sugar on some 10 plantations owned by the company, company plantations, which were the only sugar plantations in the colony. The company plantations were also among the largest plantations in the colony. And uh, here you can see, oops, a, a map, an 18th century map of Berbice here, the coast. And then the first 20 or 30 miles or so, nobody lives here because there's too much flooding. And then the plantation started stretching over about a uh, hundred or more kilometers. So it's a very stretched out colony. And then a number of them along the tributary of the Berbiz River, the Kanji River here. Plantations were small. The company plantations, some of which you see here are bigger and they contain anywhere from 80 to 150 people. But many of these plantations in the hands of private people um, only were quite small, anywhere from 8 to 15 to 40 to maybe 80 people. So we're not talking here about a colony that resembles, say, Jamaica or Barbados in the 18th century. It's a much more frontier kind of place. Plantations, so were strong, as I said, along these two rivers and all travel happened on the river, as it still does a lot today. Um, this is a modern map to which we will go back. Much of travel in uh, Guyana today happens on the rivers. This is, for instance, the highway from Georgetown to Brazil. And you can see that, uh, that particularly in the rainy season when I traveled it, uh, you completely get splattered with mud. Um, and so most people do their travel as they did in the 18th century on the rivers. This is an image of a tent boat in which um, enslaved people would have rowed Europeans who hid from the sun under the, in the little hut. Or as people now do, uh, they move around in dugouts and little canoes and an occasional motorboat. These are pictures I took when I was there. Beyond the sliver of control that these European plantations represented lay um, savanna and rainforest that was really inhabited only by Native Americans and where Europeans rarely ventured. In the decades, and let me see, I think I have a few more. This is an image of the Berbies River, gives you a sense of how wide it was. Uh, people moving about in canoes today and a last image of the river that gives you an idea of how uh, dense those forests are, not easy places to move around in. And then uh, one more image here, back to this slide. On the, in the decade before the rebellion, Berbice uh, experienced uh, uh, difficult circumstances, uh, drought, crop failures, and deathly epidemics that killed large numbers, not only of the Europeans, but also of the enslaved. And disruptions caused by the Seven Years' War meant that supply ships from Holland um, arrived much more sporadically, causing widespread hunger, uh, particularly among the enslaved. And so the rebellion begins on a Sunday, of course, always a Sunday in February 1763. It spreads very rapidly. It begins here sort of in the heart of the colony. The insurgents took over the entire colony about the space of a week. The Dutch are extremely afraid, really don't put up any sort of resistance. Uh, they're afraid they'll be cut off if the rebellion, if the rebels would be able to take over 
wanted the lower uh, plantations and though, so they flee to the coast from where most of them take off for Europe or neighboring colonies and the Dutch governor digs in on this plantation here, Dageraad or Daybreak, where he has no idea that he'll be pinned down for the next year and a half. Um, he receives uh, supplies there from neighboring colonies and also soldiers from Suriname and eventually also soldiers from St. Eustatius. That summer, the colonists and the rebels sort of live in an uneasy stalemate as neither can defeat the other. Uh, and the, the rebel leader, Governor Coffey, tries attempts to break out of this stalemate by written negotiations, uh, which unfortunately uh, go nowhere. In fact, these negotiations uh, lead to a coup against him. Uh, and in the early fall, he commits suicide to uh, safeguard his own honor. And the leadership of the rebellion is taken over by another African man named Atta. And really not until massive help arrives from the Dutch Republic in late 1764, and more importantly, until massive numbers of Amerindian allies from neighboring colonies begin to arrive and sort of seal off the hinterlands of the colony, do the Dutch begin to slowly win back their battered uh, colony, and even then it takes them well until the summer of 1764, more than a year after the whole thing started. Um, and the main reason they win, I think, ultimately is not only because they have these amazing allies, but also because the enslaved have none. They lack both the long Atlantic reach of the Dutch, so they can't get new guns, new soldiers, medications, and food. Um, uh, and there are no allies on the South American continent willing to fight with them. After hasty trials, the Dutch execute 120 men and four women uh, by fire, by breaking people on the wheel, or by hanging them on the gallows. By the end of the rebellion, somewhere between the third and the fifth, can't be certain of the enslaved people who were there before the rebellion, are gone. Uh, most of them have died either in warfare or of disease or hunger or exposure, and a certain number have been taken out of the colony with their owners when they fled at the beginning of the rebellion. Um, European soldiers and sailors sent to Burbies also die in alarming numbers. I, I, I again don't have exact numbers, but I would be surprised if more than a third survived it. Berbice never recovers under the Dutch, uh, and the company only survives due to massive loans from the Dutch government, which they can never repay. And eventually, tired out of bailing out poor companies that are too big to fail, uh, the Dutch uh, government in 1795 takes over the Wild Coast colonies directly, sort of does away with these companies that have been running some of these colonies. But then, of course, in the early 19th century, Berbice, Essequibo, and Demerara uh, are taken over by the Brits, become British Guiana, and are lost to the Dutch forever. And so the book um, chronicles the, the military and political confrontations between the rebels and the insurgents but it also reveals um, the internal dynamics of the rebellion. And I think that's uh, where I want to concentrate my talk today. These internal dynamics lay bare how, uh, as in fact in all major rebellions and revolutions, people were divided politically along multiple axes, including birthplace and ethnicity, uh, class, if you can talk about class in, in a society like that, gender and, and political vision. The insurgents were led, let me see what I have next, by a man named Coffey, uh, who had reportedly come to Berbice as a child. He identified as an Amina, 
meaning that he would have come from this area here, or he would have shipped from this area here as a captive, the Gold Coast, uh, the present day uh, Ghana. And most of the senior leadership of the rebellion were people who identified as Amina, who were known as Coromanti among the English. And some of you may have read Vince Brown's wonderful book about Techie's revolt in Jamaica in the 1760s, where the Coromanti were similarly the leaders of the revolt. Gold Coast people tended to be well-schooled in statecraft and military matters. They came from hierarchical cultures in which people avidly sought avenues of, of social advancement that often included the use of, uh, of slaves and the ownership of slaves. Um, the Amina were in charge of the Berbice Rebellion, but people of all kinds of African nations, as well as Creoles, albeit in smaller numbers, participated in the rebellion. As the rebellion became more diffuse after Governor Kofi's death in the fall, uh, ethnic conflict and, and violence among the insurgents uh, increased. Now, Governor Kofi, um, as he styled himself, and, and Captain Akara, his second in command, organized an army and they organized a government that enforced compliance with their rule, that neutralized opponents, uh, that recruited soldiers, of course, and that uh, formulated a strategy. Uh, they collected guns and supplies. They forced people on the company plantations back into the fields to make rum. And they set others to uh, gardening in the provision grounds to, uh, to feed the soldiers. Uh, rebel officers and officials were also attended by servants and by slaves. And so the Amina created a rebellion that was both hierarchical and like all major upheavals, implied, uh, employed both violence and coercion. In a series of letters to the Dutch governor, as I mentioned, uh, Kofi laid out his, his bold vision of freedom. He proposed in these written negotiations that he and the Dutch divide the colony in two. He and his people would keep the, the southernmost part of the colony, uh, so south of Fort Nassau, and he suggested that the Dutch keep everything that was closer to the coast. Now, Kofi, as I said, is not the first self-liberated man to engaged in negotiations with his colonial opponents. We have peace negotiations uh, between Maroons and colonial officials uh, all over the Americas, starting in the 16th century. Uh, and it's likely that Kofi, uh, Kofi would have heard through the common winds of the trans-colonial slave grapevine of negotiations, say, in Jamaica in the 1730s. He would have certainly heard of the negotiations between Suriname authorities and Maroons in 1760 and 1762. But, but Coffey was proposing an agreement on a much grander scale uh, than what Maroons had proposed. He, he initiated the negotiations, not the colonial officials, and he approached the, the Dutch governor as one head of state to another. Um, his proposal to divide the colony in half was really unprecedented. He was not uh, offering to retreat with his people to villages uh, in the bush, in the jungle, but he was suggesting living next door to the Dutch as, uh, as one nation next to another. He made it clear that he wanted free trade with any ships that might uh, show up uh, on the coast. It appears that he was not after freedom and subsistence maroon style, but that he had in mind capitalist style plantation production, likely with forced labor, as he had been doing, growing sugar to distill, to distill rum, both for, the, for their own, the, the, the insurgents' own uh, consumption and to trade on the international market as the Dutch did. 
Some 30 years later, uh, the same of course happens in Haiti when Haitian leaders compel newly self-emancipated people to grow sugar on plantations, which is not work that anybody would want to do if they weren't forced because uh, Caribbean labor problems are of course not solved uh, with emancipation. And so I think that Governor Kofi's uh, radical vision turned his rebellion into a, a true revolution, but it likely also turned off many of the rank and file. In fact, African-Americans or African descended people's responses uh, to the insurgency and their alignments ran the gamut from enthusiastic support to evasion and dodging. Uh, people's decisions hinged, of course, on their own personal circumstances, social tensions on their plantations, as well as larger strategic, political, and, uh, and uh, ideological considerations. A few people chose to side with the Dutch. Many more decided to join the rebels. Pretty much everybody went and plundered their own plantation house, uh, taking back uh, what their labor had wrought. But whatever their sympathies in terms of committing themselves, people remained, many people remained aloof, uh, attempting to stay autonomous or postponing making a decision until they had no choice. By their own accounts, they hid in the rainforest or in the savannah behind their plantations whenever the Dutch or rebels or Amerindians appeared. And as soon as any of those groups moved away, they moved back onto their plantations. And I argued that um, hiding from the rebels signaled more than a, a fearful refusal to participate in armed revolt, although I'm sure fear played a role. Um, but I argue that avoiding the rebels was a political statement about preferring life without masters. Um, avoiding the rebels was a, a, a declaration of independence, uh, if you will. Like self-governing people throughout history, the non-committed sought to evade war, uh, the appropriation of their labor, and outside rule. And in dodging all combatants, whether they be rebels or Dutch or Amerindians, people became fugitives in their own backyards, living independent of the Dutch and the rebels. They camped in their own uh, backyard, so to speak, near their own provision grounds and near their plantation pantries where subsistence agriculture did not require much coercion. This alternative, I think, would have been particularly attractive to women, to children, to the less able-bodied. Uh, and uh, all of these folks would have um, preferred that to joining a military campaign or being incorporated into the rebellion as workers. As one man put it, quote, he did not want to be anyone's slave, and so he stayed home, end quote. The, uh, and I think that such preferences were likely also fueled by people's experiences back home, where the Atlantic slave trade fomented powerful and hierarchical uh, and militarized states in the 18th century, as, as Toby Green, for instance, has recently shown, among others and lots of uh, West African commoners had grown wary of uh, rulers who appropriated their labor through taxes, turned their sons into soldiers and fed increasing streams of captives to Europeans on the coast. So uh, I wanna give an example of, for instance, what happened on this plantation here, Boslust. Uh, when the uprising started, the inhabitants of Boslust, high up the Berbys River, as you can see on this map, charted their own future. Rather than kill their enslavers, as the rebels were urging everybody to do, they encouraged them to flee. Um, 
they besieged me, the, the owner of Postlust, who survived uh, his ordeal later reported, they besieged me, he said, that I had better leave as soon as possible if my family and I wanted to avoid getting murdered. But his 18 slaves, that's all he had, declined his invitation to accompany him and his family to neighboring Demerara. Uh, they said, why would we go with you? We have always had a good life on this plantation. We have our gardens here. We don't want to leave our gardens. And if the bad people come, by which they meant the rebels, we will kill them. Uh, they promised him that they would not abandon his crops, uh, that they would not abandon the plantation, that they would in fact harvest his cotton and his cacao and coffee as they had done before. And they offered to uh, carry their luggage uh, to Demerara, uh, um, perhaps also to ensure his prompt departure. A free Native American uh, family living on the plantation also came along. And as soon as this group of people uh, crossed into Demerara, the enslaved people uh, took all the luggage at night and with the Amerindians hoofed it back to the bear bees. And with their enslavers gone, uh, these uh, workers, these people at Boslust were now free. They continued to live on the plantation indeed, occasionally hiding in the bush when anybody showed up they didn't want to see. Uh, rebels or Europeans mostly. Despite earlier promises, I doubt that they did much work in the, in the plantation crops, but it is likely that they would have maintain, maintained and, and no doubt expanded their provision grounds to feed themselves and their families. And their story, I think, illustrates how refusing to join the rebellion was not a statement of loyalty to the Dutch, even though, of course, the Dutch like to interpret it that way, but rather that they calculated that armed insurgency likely spelled suicide, whether um, on the battlefield uh, or from hunger in the bush or on the execution grounds. They probably would have quickly figured out that joining the rebels might mean a new regime of forced labor. And above all, I think that they were keen to work their own, uh, what they considered their own land, their own plots as they wished without anybody telling them what to do without any kind of master. So in 1763, as I mentioned, Coffee was overthrown in a coup and to save his honor, he commits suicide and with his death, the, the notion of a nation state or an independent colony dies uh, or died. But, but questions remained, of course, over social hierarchy, over military strategy, and most importantly, over the shape of the post-slavery uh, future. Coffey had, had sought to reproduce a, a Dutch-style colony. His successor, Atta, also an Amina, as I mentioned, had his own designs for a centralized chain of command. Um, it appears that Atta imagined a, a more conventional maroon-like uh, polity removed from the institutions of European colonization and, and merchant capitalism. But many of his officers wearied of his authoritarian ways and they became his adversaries. And, it is at this point, as I mentioned, that the rebellion becomes as much a civil war among various uh, nations uh, who fight each other as it is an anti-colonial war against the Dutch. Perhaps Atta's rivals had, had come around to a non-state solution of decentralized um, polities, uh, this, by the way, is the wrong slide. This is a statue of, of Kofi as it now exists uh, in uh, Georgetown in Guyana today. Um, so perhaps his rivals had come around to a, a non-state solution of decentralized communities with subsistence gardens that, uh, that required less coercion and granted, and granted more autonomy. 
uh, which, which was a solution that probably would have appealed to many of their followers as well. And so at the, at the start of the, the age of revolutions, um, the Berbice rebellion tantalized uh, African and African descended people with the prospect of liberation and autonomy. As in the revolutions that followed, the American, the Haitian uh, liberation wars in, in South America, um, these revolutions brought bitter disappointment on both scores of, of liberation and autonomy. Kofi and his fellow leaders encouraged uh, or courageously set in motion a, a process of, of self-emancipation only to see that hope defeated by, by better connected and better supplied Europeans with, with international allies. Yet at the same time, Kofi's demand uh, for half the colony to continue growing sugar came at the high price of forced labor for others. Those others were the Dodgers of the Berbice Rebellion. Their desire for autonomy uh, to, to tend their own provision gardens was not compatible with an early modern global capitalist market uh, uh, fueled by bonded labor. And so neither rebel leaders nor the mass of emancipated Berbicians could escape the, the central dilemma of the age of revolutions and beyond. And so Blood, Blood on the River uh, argues that the politics in the Beast Rebellion were as complicated and complex as any other in this era. Leaders of the rebellion wanted liberty to run a colony of their own with a, with a measure of coercion and human bondage in place. Ordinary self-emancipated people want autonomy to attend to their own farms. This difference, I think, is a common theme in the age of revolutions. Elites wanted one thing, commoners wanted another, and everybody called it freedom. And so on the one hand in this book, I'm trying to hold up the rebels as, um, as, as folks who deserve our um, admiration, uh, as, as people who, had the guts to attempt uh, to, end, to end their own enslavement anyway and to attempt self-emancipation, folks armed with a bold vision. But I'm also trying to rescue uh, from the, the condescension of posterity, if you want, the many people who were either uncommitted or dodged the rebellion uh, and who did so, I argue, not because they were afraid, but because they had a different vision of what they wanted as their futures. And, and I think in that respect, uh, the book not only rescues from relative obscurity a, an important instance of uh, resistance from below, but it also represents an important strand in the intellectual history of, of the Black Atlantic. Thank you. Let me stop sharing. I hope that was neither too long nor too short. It was Goldilocks just right. Um, okay, thank you so much for a fantastic introduction to really exciting research and the kind of outlining both the both what your findings and how you go about finding this um, to, to give us a very a much more complex story of uh, what rebellions were taking place and, and the shape that they took. Um, especially fascinated by the kind of, everyone calls it freedom, but what is it um, that, that that makes it? Um, so we're gonna open to the floor for all kinds of questions. Practically speaking, I if you wanna raise your hand with the reaction button, so that's at the, at the bottom of your zoom screen normally um, then I can see that happening or if you prefer to 
uh, write in the chat that you have a question, I can call on you. Or if you prefer, prefer not to speak at all, but want me to write to read it out loud, type your question in the chat and I can read it out. Um, so you've got three options. And I already see a bunch of hands. So let's move to that already. Um, ben is the first on my list. Uh, thanks, Elizabeth. Um, Marjolaina, that was uh, fascinating. That was enjoyable. And I uh, can't wait to read the book. By strange coincidence, um, I, I wrote a micro history uh, about a uh, unknown conflict um, in the border region uh, where the contemporary borders of Holland, Belgium, and uh, Germany intersect that takes place between 1762 and 1765. I just mentioned that. <laughs> I don't suggest uh, any uh, connection, but uh, what an amazing uh, coincidence. Um, but I, I wanted to ask you, um, you mentioned, and uh, one of the most, to me, interesting aspects of your book was how you were describing the um, uh, strategies and reactions of, of, of uh, many of the slaves, including Kofi, um, as being conditioned by their previous experience in Africa, the Amina people from the Gold Coast um, uh, with um, experience of complex uh, political and social hierarchies and forms of exploitation uh, that, you, that you went into. That, that uh, was, was fascinating to me. And um, I guess um, it made me wonder whether there were um, enslaved people from other parts of Africa as well uh, in, in, in Berbice, or if not, perhaps uh, there in uh, other colonial settings in the Americas, and whether you can see a distinction uh, in how people from different parts of Africa acted uh, politically um, uh, as, you know, in, in the colonial settings. Um, thanks very much, Ben. I'm gonna look at your micro history actually. Um, so the majority of folks the Dutch would have brought from um, Africa to the new world in the 18th century come from three broad areas. I meant to point it out on the slide, but I forgot. So the Gold Coast, uh, the area north of that, so present day Sierra Leone and Senegambia, and then further south in West Central Africa uh, around the Congo River, um, we see, um, or I see in this rebellion, people who claim um, uh, sort of national uh, ethnic identities that come out of all three of those areas. Uh, Kanga folks in uh, Senegambia and, uh, and Sierra Leone, but also Luango and Congo from the region further south. I don't know that anybody has linked specific political ideas other than for the Coromantee uh, to specific areas in West Africa, uh, a woman did it a little while ago um, for the people coming, uh, known as Kisama, coming from West Central Africa um, uh, in a book which the title I've now forgotten, but then uh, that book has gotten lost because it turned out she, she was a white woman masquerading as a black woman in the United States. And so she had to leave academe, but she did actually looked at uh, how people from uh, Kasima, an, an area in West Central Africa where lots of people were themselves marooned from their own oppressive governments, moved to South, were taken as captives to South America and were there particularly active um, as Maroons uh, in the New World. So I think people are beginning to take these political identities much more seriously, but hooking them up is complicated, partly because just because somebody took ship in in Amina uh, or, or uh, on the Mina coast doesn't necessarily mean they were Amina. And we're still, I think, somewhat struggling to understand what these diasporic ethnic identities mean that people take on. If people call themselves Amina 
uh, in the new world, what does that mean exactly? So, um, so I don't think there is as clear a correspondence, but people are beginning to realize that obviously people do not come as tabula rasa, but bring ideas about politics, but also enmities with them uh, from their own from their own home regions. Thanks. It's the best I can do, I'm afraid. Fascinating aspect of, of that story, definitely. Um, the next person on my list is Daniel. Oh, excuse me. Thank you very much. Oh, excuse me again. Thank you for an excellent paper. I've just got two quite linked questions. Um, first of all, who were the slaves of the slaves? How is it decided you get to become a soldier, an officer in Kofifi's army administration? you have to keep working the plantation. Was there any sense that it was a form of ethnic divide or was it just a sort of a cliquist, elitist sort of idea that it was just as long as you were an ally, then you would get to be free in this new rebellious colony rather than enslaved still? And secondly, was there a sense that there was a divide between field slaves and house slaves? Obviously, this is sometimes overstated in some materials, but was it the house slaves running away with the masters back to the colony and was it the field slaves becoming part of the rebellion or being in turn enslaved by it thank you okay thank you for those great questions daniel um we have some insight into how decisions were made uh from what people talk about in these interrogations it appears that um uh, lots of drivers, so enslaved men who, almost always men, who would have run work crews on the plantations. These were called bombas in Berbis. Bombas often uh, brought their entire workforce with them into a rebellion or helped their work, their, their people resist the rebels. And so in order to attract Bombas, who were charismatic people with a following, Bombas were often immediately made officers uh, in the army, or some Bombas were put in charge of certain plantations that the rebels wanted to keep in production. Uh, we also see that people who did not want to support the rebellion were often put to work. I think that the folks growing sugar were the people who knew how to do it. So on the company plantations, those people often did, were not keen to participate in the rebellion. I think largely because these company plantations were old, some dated back to the 17th century, and there were many more Creoles, people born in the colony rather than Africans which meant that these were people with more to lose. These were people who would have had children, the graves of grandparents, uh, a longer history there, potentially more privileges in the forms of well-tilled gardens or chickens and so on and so forth that they didn't want to see taken by the rebels. So it's partly political, it's partly skill-based, it's partly strategic on the part of the rebels, rewarding people who, uh, who have clout on their plantation and who do the right thing in the beginning. There's quite a bit of talk about um, men uh, showing up with the heads of their owners um, as a sign that they are a, a big rebel and they ought to be rewarded. And so to gel all these different leaders into a cohesive whole, I think, these leaders and their own followers are awarded with government uh, positions or military positions um, in order to tie them to the rebellion. So it's all of the things you mentioned. I don't see a ton of difference uh, between field slaves and house slaves in part because we have very few inventories of plantations for 18th century Berbice other than for the company plantations. So I don't always know who did what. Um, I can definitely see that Bombas uh, were very important, but, and there are, and, uh, but other than that, it's hard for me to tell. Thank you very much. Interestingly enough, though, historians always talk about 
most resistance happened on sugar plantations because the work was the hardest. And in Berbice, that is not the case. The people working on the sugar plantations are least likely to want to participate, perhaps in part because they figure if they do participate, they might have to work in the fields. Uh, but also, I think, because of this, their situation is a little bit different. Thank you so much. Can I can I throw in another a, a division into that? Because it's such a fascinating and different um, localities and, and or kind of internal divisions. But because you mentioned like I say, it's frequently it's men. How much do we know about the gendered aspect of this at um, all? Mm -hmm. Or is that well, just not recorded? Yeah. No, there's there's quite a bit. And I, I wrote a whole article about women in the rebellion, actually, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, it's tricky. I mean, it's clear, I think, that rebellion is something, armed rebellion is something like all wars that benefits young men who can carry a gun. Uh, they have opportunities for advancement. Obviously, they run a lot of risk, too, because they can get killed in battle and they do get killed in battle. But but there is also a lot of opportunity for them to advance in the ranks, for instance. Uh, and on the whole, it appears to me that this rebellion is more emancipatory to men it is to than it is to women. The women are still required to take care of kids. They're still required to cook for the men. They are supposed to take care of the soldiers. There's some evidence, uh, and not, it's probably not surprising there's not, there's not more of it because I don't think people wanted to talk about this in front of the Dutch, but there is some evidence of particularly young women being taken from plantations in order to be given to certain rebel leaders. Many of these men would have come from cultures where having more than one wife was common. And if you wanted to show your status, you needed more than one wife. Kofi himself, we know that during the rebellion, there were at least three women whom he considered his wives, a Dutch woman, a native woman, interestingly enough, and at least one woman of African descent. So we see that. Um, and I, I think that on the whole, it is likely that, that women were also more resistant to rebellion just because they were responsible to keep their kids safe and old people safe and to keep everybody fed and uh, keep them from being hungry. Um, so I, I think that what happens to women is what we see in many civil wars and wars, particularly a war like this, where the entire colony becomes a battlefront. So the home front and the battlefront really are one, making life much more tricky. But there are a number of women who are high up in the rebellion. And interestingly enough, the women who are executed by the Dutch are all women who functioned as um, advisors to male rebel leaders. And uh, in the interrogations, people would say, oh, so-and-so, Barbara, she advised Kofi on who should live and who should die. And again, this is uh, a West African, in certain areas of West Africa, quite common that uh, female relatives of leaders sort of made strategic decisions about uh, who was a good supporter and who was not, who should be rewarded and who should be punished. Yeah. Fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, Hans is next on my list of people with hands. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, um, Marjolaine, for your very interesting talk. I will, it's just a very simple question, maybe. Um, could you tell us something more about the language which was used, like the language that was used for the peace negotiations, the language that was used between rebels, the language that was used to take those interviews, um, mm -hmm. yeah, everything that has to do with language. Yes. Um, oh. um, unfortunately, uh, I, I've had a number of queries from linguists who say, we want to study bear be Dutch, please tell us any words you found. And I found virtually nothing because the Dutch clerks do a very thorough job in translating Berbice Dutch or Creole into standard Dutch. Uh, every once in a while, um, they will say, we can't question so-and-so because nobody speaks their language. Uh, 
And other times they will say um, this particular uh, examination was translated by Andries or translated by Kofi, some enslaved person who speaks their language. But clearly, sometimes they can't find anybody who speaks that language. Doesn't happen that often. It would have seemed to me a pretty good strategy to pretend you didn't understand anything, but apparently that didn't work. Um, the letters that are written uh, are written by the initial letters that Kofi sends are written by an enslaved man named Prince, and his Dutch is difficult to understand. Uh, it, it, it's not standard Dutch, and the grammar is not standard, and, um, the, and, and so it's not always entirely clear what is meant. The later letters that Kofi sends are clearly written by one of the Surinamese mutineers, the soldiers who rebel, 45 of them show up in the rebel camp, 30 of them are executed by the rebels against Kofi's wishes. He's very upset when he hears about that. But 15 are kept alive, and one of them, the sergeant, uh, begins to write these letters. And I can tell because he was German, his inflection is very German. And some of the soldiers are later court martialed in Suriname, and I have their uh, investigations, and they talk about that the letters were written by this sergeant. Uh, so those sound very Dutch. And some of those letters, the first half, he's writing on behalf of Coffee, And the second half, he's writing on behalf of himself and the other mutineers saying, by the way, we don't want to come back. We really support these people. Um, uh, because it appears that at some point, these mutineers get a, le a letter from their own officer saying, you've done a really bad thing. Uh, you know, making common cause with heathens. And, uh, but if you come home now, we, we will exonerate you. And they say, we don't consider them heathens and we don't think we have defiled ourselves and we're gonna stay with them until the end. So the letters are very interesting uh, and they're written by various folks. I don't think they're ever written by Kofi himself. Fantastic. Um, Jaap Jacobs, you're the next on my list. Hey, Jaap. Hey, Marjolein. Thank you very much for a fascinating paper. Um, there's many things that I could ask, but one remark that you made at the beginning struck me when you apologized for not being a historian of the Dutch Republic. Now, that struck me because in my, cons but rather uh, as a historian of the Atlantic world, and that struck me because in my conception of the Atlantic world, Europe is a firm part of it. So, and thinking about it, and thinking about the concept of rebellion here, I was wondering whether those who rebel against the authority of a republic that was itself born of rebellion raises at least an, a sense of irony, um, for my part at least. But the next thought was, did this thinking occur in Barbies as well among the Dutch. Was this called a rebellion? So what is the terminology that is being used? Is there a reference to any past events in Europe that they refer to? Mm -hmm. And in a similar way, that applies to the legal grounds for capital punishment afterwards as well. Are those grounds similar as those applied in rebellions in Europe? Okay, thanks, Jan. Um, okay, you, you, you caught me. I made a, a, a bad uh, division. Um, there, is, there seems to be no awareness among the Dutch that there is anything ironic about this. It does seem to me that they are pretty pragmatic about the whole thing. There's sort of the idea that, of course, people want to rebel. If I were enslaved, I'd want to rebel. So th there's not a lot of hand-wringing, which I sometimes see in British sources about how could this happen? We were so good to them. There is, they're much more like, ah, of course, they're rebelling. You know, you be a, a, we want to treat them right because that reduces the chance of rebellion. But of course, people are going to try to rebel. Um, the Dutch governor calls it either an oorlog a war. He often refers to it as a revolutie, the revolutie from the Zwarte. Um, uh, but other than that, I see no references to the Dutch own past. 
um, in terms of the judicial stuff, that is really interesting because when the Dutch decide that they're going to try these people, uh, Governor von Hohenheim writes to the to the company and he goes, you know, the, the Dutch rules are kind of complicated. And uh, since we all know that enslaved people lie a lot and stuff, and we want to kind of do this expeditiously, I would like, he's basically indirectly saying, I'd like to set some of those rules aside. And uh, I think if, uh, if people deny that they have, for instance, murdered Christians, as long as they're two believable witnesses, we should be able to execute them. And I think they do this in part because they don't want to engage in a lot of time consuming torture. And so then they proceed on that ground that two witnesses is enough to execute somebody. The company meanwhile receives this and they go, holy moly, we don't want large numbers of enslaved people killed. They're quelling the rebellion. Let's just kill the leaders and let's pardon everybody else so we can get this show back on the road. And they write to the governor and they say, you don't really seem to understand the rules very well. Absolutely, we have to adhere by Dutch standards of justice. By the time they get the Dutch in Berbice get those letters, they've already executed most people. So the company is asking for restraint. The governor is eager to do, to be really strict, but many of the slaveholders are not that eager to see large numbers of people killed either because they want plantations back in production. So there's a lot of haggling around that. And um, in the end, a number of people are pardoned because by then the letters from the Republic have been received and the governor realized that, oops, uh, we, we need to cool this. Um, and so uh, in the last group of people condemned to die, I, th I think most of them are in the end pardoned. Does that mean that what they are charged with is not rebellion, but criminal acts conducted yes, in the rebellion? Yes, that's right. They're, is they're it similar to the situation in Europe? Um, well, I don't know, because I don't know much about the criminal system in Holland when it comes to punishing people about rebellion. I mean, they are punishing people for Christian murder. So that's murder, Destru destruction of property, arson, which is heavily punished in, in uh, the Dutch Republic too. And I think that leadership in the rebellion is, uh, it, I don't know how they classify that exactly as sort of a, um, for, the, for the mutineers, some of whom are uh, executed, uh, for, um, what do you call it, uh, what is the term, uh, 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 I don't know the term in English, and I think that there is a similar idea that, you know, to stand up against the authorities, including slaveholders, is in itself a punishable offense. But that, that pretty much is punishing them for rebellion and for les majestés. Majest yes, yes, les majestés, that's right. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. But Thank that term is not used in the records of the rebellion itself. That term is only used in the in the case of the mutineers in the court martials in Suriname. Fascinating. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Indeed, fascinating. Um, and you're next on my list. Okay. I hope this works. Um, my mic often doesn't work. Um, I'm, that was fascinating. Um, I'm really looking forward to reading your book, which I shall order as soon as the seminar is over. Um, uh, I wondered if you could say something more about about religion, um, be, because you mentioned <clears throat> a couple times in passing that that was one of the things that the that the Dutch were particularly focused on was it, um, and I um, whereas I think you felt that that was perhaps not so. Uh, crucial in the rebellion itself, but I just wondered what it was that the, what was the tenor of the Dutch discourse about that? Okay, thank you. Um, and the, it's interesting that many of the Dutch people in Berbice, as late as the 1760s, <laughs> refer to themselves as Christians, not Europeans, not Dutch, but Christians. It's the Christians versus the slaves. They don't really call them heathens either, other than in this one letter. But but it's so it's the Christians and uh, and slaves. Um, I there was no religion was no doubt important in this rebellion. There are some hints of obeah, 
which is a, uh, a, 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 a mixture of new world and old world spiritual beliefs that involve both healing and potentially what the Dutch called witchcraft. Um, and there are clearly some uh, leaders who are themselves obey a man. Um, and at least one of the women put to death appears to have been active in Obeya. But I think that this is an aspect of the rebellion that these very nuchtere, these very down-to-earth Dutch don't care about it. They don't ask, why did you rebel? How did you organize it? Uh, they, they don't care. They're very pragmatic. They want to punish the worst ones and then they want to get on with it. Uh, which is probably why when people provide detail, the clerk goes, he said more, but it wasn't relevant. Um, so I think that uh, the re-enslaved don't talk about religion much because it's not what's being asked about. And these are things that you keep to yourselves. Um, I also don't know, for instance, no doubt some folks were Muslim. And I know very little about that. I have not seen that mentioned. Um, so religion is a really underexplored topic in this, uh, in this particular um, instance. I am sort of writing a follow-up uh, study of the two men who are rebel leaders and then um, uh, betray the rebellion, uh, end up uh, in the Netherlands or in the Dutch Republic for seven years, and then go with for Gu to Suriname to fight Maroons, and I'm sort of writing their life histories, and one of them practices Obeya, and, uh, and so I know a little bit more about him, uh, but on the whole, religion is really a hidden dimension of this. Thank you. Unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next on my list is Deborah. Hi. Um, I have a couple Hi, questions. <laughs> How are you doing? Um, it's good to see you. Um, so I think the way that you're setting it up, uh, that you set it up in this talk, it's very much that the Burbese Rebellion is part of the Age of Revolutions. It's, it's one among a number of different revolutions happening. But I guess I am wondering if you could talk about whether you think there is anything particularly Dutch about uh, this rebellion. And specifically, I guess I'm wondering, because obviously there's the Curacao slave revolt some years later, is there anything in in the interactions or in the startups of the revolt or anything at all that you feel is particularly Dutch? And then I have a second question also. Sorry, okay. this is going into the details of the book a lot. I've actually had the privilege of already reading it, but um, I just read Jared Hardesty's book, Mutiny on the Rising Sun, and uh, which is about uh, um, mutiny in 1743 uh, off the coast of Suriname or sort of in Suriname. Um, and he also mentions this character, Gedney Clark, who you have kind of coming in to save the day with English soldiers. And I guess it just um, it made me wonder more about kind of the English connections uh, in all of this, or like the, uh, the transatlantic nature of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and maybe that is the, the way to start answering you is to start by the second question, which is that there is definitely a very transatlantic component to this, right, both in terms of um, the Dutch really worrying that if they don't suppress this rebellion, it will spread to the other colonies. They're, of course, particularly worried about Suriname, and the Surinamese governor within two weeks writes to the governor in Berbice and says, please make sure that your colonists don't write any more letters to Suriname about this, because the slaves here are already singing songs, making fun of the Berbice slaveholders. They're clearly experiencing a lot of glee. Um, Gedney Clark, this guy who is actually American, uh, he's from Massachusetts, I think, ends up on, is it Barbados? Uh, owns plantations in Demerara. Um, feels that the Dutch are idiotic in, in running their colonies through a company and that they're not putting enough money into defending them. And so when this rebellion breaks out, he's worried it will spread to the neighboring colonies and he sends soldiers there. He doesn't really save the day in Berbice. He, he saves the rebellion from potentially spreading uh, to Demerara. And when he sets this up, he gets the British Navy uh, 
to, to ship these soldiers over, even though there is no official anything where the, the English authorities have given permission to this uh, Navy commander to do these things. So, uh, so that is, is very interesting. The Dutch governor uh, von Hohenheim is very worried about asking any Brits for help. He's worried that they will come and help and then stay and take over Berbies. Uh, the governor von Schraven Zande in, in Demerara and Esquibo is not worried about that. Uh, and so he does ask for help from people like Clark. So, so in both in terms of where the Dutch get help, how other people, other Europeans feel a certain solidarity clearly, but also worries about uh, potential competition among Europeans, and then this long Atlantic reach of the Dutch. It's, it's a very transatlantic thing. In terms of is there anything Dutch about it? Uh, not really to me, other than the way in which the Dutch react, which is, and it sounds stereotypical, but it really looks it to me just very sort of matter of fact about it. Um, both both in how they react to it and then in the aftermath of it. I think that the fact that it is run by a company and not a terribly rich one and one that is perhaps spending more of its money on its shareholders, uh, that may have something to do with it. Uh, and that is a particularly Dutch feature, perhaps. Um, and I really think somebody ought to investigate this company of Bear Beast, the Societeit from Bear Beast. There's, there are a lot of records. I looked at the, them some, but I just already had too much to deal with. Um, so I don't know. I'm not sure I have a super satisfactory answer. Um, but in the same way that, you know, people like Gert Oost Indy have written about. Uh, um, Folks often saying the Dutch were the most cruel, for instance, vis-a-vis -vis their enslaved people and him saying, you know, all slavery is cruel. I, I think I would agree with that. I don't think there's anything particularly Dutch in how these slaveholders interact with their enslaved people. There's sadism and cruelty and wanton violence all over the Atlantic world when it comes to slave societies. But if you, having read the book, have a better answer, I would love to hear it. <laughs> I just, um, I'm more, I, I'm very, just very interested in the Society for Peace and the company. So you have actually, uh, you've pointed me further in that direction. <laughs> okay, cool. Let me know if I can help. Already new research. <laughs> Uh, fostering from all of this. Um, Joris, you're the next on my list. Um, thank hey, you. Joris. Hi, Marlena. Thank you for your um, uh, presentation. I really enjoyed it. Also, I hope my internet is stable enough because um, I'm using the neighbor's Wi Fi. So I'm hoping that it doesn't drop. Is that a Dutch yeah. cheapness, so no, uh, yours? Or, um... No, 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 no. I've moved to the UK and my house is now so large that I don't reach the home Wi Fi in the bedroom where I'm working. So I'm using the mm -hmm. neighbor who is, is, a, is a college and they have uh, a room. So I. Gotcha. Uh, but you, you do break up a little right. bit. So um, I have two questions. Okay, I will, I will give it short. Um, I have two questions and they're both out of ignorance and one is stemming from this uh, that I'm not working. Um, and I was wondering these um, slaves or the enslaved people that are being convicted, are their owners compensated financially for the fact that their former property is being um, 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 uh, destroyed uh, by the leadership, by the, by the company? That's the first one. And then you made this offhand comment of saying, of course it started on a Sunday the rebellion. And I was wondering what type of other activities that are of course always happening um, in, in rebellions, because I wasn't aware that it's always on a Sunday, but what other things are always happening with rebellions? Um, okay, uh, interesting questions. Um, most rebellions happen on a Sunday. I think because um, enslaved or uh, slave holders are uh, either are away at church, but also people don't have to show up when the bell rings early. Uh, 
And so if they're running around getting themselves together, it's not as noticeable. So that's, I think, relatively many enslaved rebellions happen on a Sunday. In terms of compensation, I feel like at one point I knew the answer to that question, but I can't recall now. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they were, but I would have to look that up. Um, I think regardless of whether people were compensated, uh, and I will, I'll, I'll, I will look at that, is I think because um, slave ships did not come to Bear Beast nearly as often as both the authorities and colonists wanted, people did not want their enslaved people killed on the whole. Uh, they had this sense that uh, folks were chastened and they could keep people under control and they needed workers badly. Um, so there are, in fact, instances of slaveholders who sort of secretly take their people back and don't even tell the authorities that they have them back because they don't want them caught up in this process. There are also examples of slaveholders who do horrific things to um, enslaved people who are exonerated by the Dutch, but they themselves feel that these folks have done bad things and they punish them privately. Um, so both things happen. But the compensation one is an, an interesting one and I will, I'll, I'll, I'll try to look that up. I would find it hard to believe I wouldn't have thought of that, but it's entirely possible. Thanks, Joris. Thanks so much for that. Um, the next hand that I've got on my list is Daniel. Thank you. Uh, sorry to come back with a third question. Uh, you mentioned that one of Kofi's wives was Dutch, and that's what sort of inspired my question, which was, is there any example of the ultimate fear and perhaps the worst crime in the mind of slaveholders, which is flipping the system? Were there many Europeans and Dutch enslaved? by the former slave. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Daniel. There are a number of Dutch people taken hostage by the rebels, and they are put to work. Um, particularly uh, women and children are, are put to work in the gardens. Um, some of these hostages are later killed. Others are used as messengers. We have some evidence, for instance, of a woman who is let go, a Dutch woman with her children to be a messenger. And she says that she survived because the enslaved people who had lived on her plantation stood up for her and said, we don't want her killed. She has actually been pretty decent to us and, uh, and, and, and we don't want her killed. And Kofi listens to them. Um, the big fear that you always read about, particularly in the British Atlantic, is that, uh, of course, slave rebels are after European wives. There's no evidence of this uh, in Berbis, except this young woman who is taken hostage. Um, her name is Georgina George. Uh, her family is uh, Huguenot, so uh, it's, it's not George as in the English George, but George is in French or Swiss. And she um, remains with the rebels until December. So she's with them for eight months, 10 months. She is known as Kofi's wife. She tries to run away several times, is caught, beaten, uh, but eventually her legs swell up. It becomes a bother to have her along and Atta lets her go. Um, she then makes her way back to the Dutch with the help of a, a formerly enslaved person whom she promises that she will advocate for. And um, I have notes in the journal of the governor saying Georgina returned, her situation was awful. She had horrific things to tell us, as you may imagine. She looked really bad, blah, 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 blah. But he doesn't give much detail because he's clearly, I think, trying to save her reputation. At some point, he wants her questioned. Um, the man who serves as her uh, Vogt, what do you call it, her, um, uh, who's looking out for her because her, her parents have been killed in the rebellion, says, God, I will God, not yeah. have her questioned. Um, in the end, she is questioned, but her transcript is gone. <laughs> And I have looked everywhere, it's gone. So I'm sure she had a lot to say, 
but we don't have it. And she is the only woman where there is a strong hint that there may have been forced sex involved. But even there, I'm not 100% certain. So this ultimate fear of um, enslaved men just want to set themselves up with white women, uh, th there is no evidence of that in Berbies. Thank you. Does it appear that the transcript was deliberately destroyed to help save our reputation, or is it just one of the unfortunates of archives? Uh, uh, the governor writes in a letter to the company, I'm enslaving her testimony and it's just not there. And it's not in the company records. Maybe um, if uh, Professor Hamer looks at them more closely, she'll find it. But, but I looked and I couldn't find it. I think that somebody at some point decided that this was too incriminating for a white woman and they, they, they did something with it. And she disappears from the records. I can't find her anywhere. She leaves Berbice uh, after she's been questioned, uh, is sent on a boat to the Dutch Republic. And, and I, I, I have looked for her, I can't find her. She'd be a fascinating person to know more about. I hear an historical novel, at least, coming up. If you can't find it in the records, do well, with the, the mutineers, the mutineers who interact with her, they talk about her. And they talk about the fact that she spoke a native language and that she did some translating for them. And uh, they refer to her as Kofi's wife. But that's it. Amazing. Um, I cannot see any hands anymore. Um, so I think How about the we, chat? and I can't, I can only see people who had to leave to make dinners in the, in the chat, <laughs> to my knowledge. Um, and I think we've grilled you for long enough. Thank you so much for both like a very interesting presentation and then dealing with a very wide range of questions. I think getting a sense of both the records and the division within communities and the transatlantic connections, um, what an extraordinary rich story. Um, so thank you so much for doing You're this. Welcome. Thank you all.